Welcome. This is a July 4th Beehive Production user call. We have Hans, Antrenig, and myself, Michael, and happy 4th of July for those who celebrate. Hans and I had a quick update on development work. Hopefully, we announce some fundraising efforts very soon. That is exciting. Uh, there was a post about how the Beehive UART is too fast in Illumos. Uh, that is apparently getting the love it needs, which is great. Here's the review on that. Um, Jonathan Perkin is working on that. Thank you for that. Let's see. Um, I should have mentioned this on yesterday's Open ZFS call. I made a quick mock-up of BSD install giving an option of a pool compatibility level. And I sent a diff off to Antrenig because, hey, you've spent more time with that code under the hood. So maybe together we can do a quick hackathon and making that work. Um, John reached out last week like saying, hey, this quiz thing from... Uh, Rob Norris seems quite cool. And ta-da, earlier this week, the BSD CAN video of that presentation showed up. I attended it. It was great. He's, Rob is awesome. He's doing great ZFS work. Uh, check it out. Um, Wi-Fi box. I, uh, Antrenig and I were talking about, say, daemon management of Beehive processes. And uh, I remembered Wi-Fi box, which takes, say, your highly incompatible uh, Wi-Fi chip in your laptop and punches it into a small Alpine Linux VM and then hands it back to, say, FreeBSD, which is kind of cool. The grammar absolutely needs a hackathon, and maybe we can do that either today or another day. But um, I would love to analyze if they are getting that uh, process supervision correct with completely in-based tools. Go ahead. Antrenne, you can always jump in. You can stop me at any time. So I just wanted to say, if if we're doing the compatibility layer in um, a BSD install for for the users, I would also recommend to see if there is anything similar in Illumos land. I know that Illumos land is not on OpenZFS right now, but the features thing, the, the features are a thing there. You know. Oh, they are. Yeah, correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, even uh, though it's not the same code base because you know they do cherry pick, so it might be a good idea to bring that into like at least Omni OS uh, as well. I, you know where so you would have also compatibility between FreeBSD and Omni OS. Hans, do you recall that being much of an issue of saying, "Hey, I'm installing Omni OS or similar smart OS, but I I specifically want to either disable a few feature flags or go with a previous feature." collection of feature flags slash compatibility right. level? Um, you want to disable feature flags of CFS, is that correct, during installation? They, uh, yes, sir, insofar as I was setting up I, a... Pre I'll just give you a use case if you're curious once you're done, sure. I don't think the installers support it, but then every distribution has its own installers. But what you can do is, before you install, you can create a pool manually. You can get a shell, create a pool manually yeah. with all the feature flags turned off that you don't want. And then instruct the installer to install on that pool. I'm pretty sure that works with OmniOS. It should also work with Open Indiana, if that's your thing. Um, not so sure about... SmartOS, but I haven't installed SmartOS in a long time. That okay. is different in any case. So, yeah. Hope this helps. Oh, thank you, and I'll just quickly share my use case. I have a running FreeBSD 13.2 system, and I want to jump to 14.1 on new disks. So I spun up a VM that simply pointed at the disks, and I set up the OS and I had a great time and there it was. And then it's like, hey, so sorry. When I tried to bring that pool into the older host OS, sorry, there's one feature flag that I haven't even heard of that's blocking the import. So I can't send data over to it and point the old OS at the new pool. And so I know how to hack the installer just to say here, dash O feature flag level, whatever this level, but I thought, what if the GUI simply said, hey, here's uh, here are the available choices if you want to do something other than default. So I did the user-facing parts and, hey, Antrenate, maybe you've got some ideas for under the hood. 
So there's that. Antoinette, any other comments on that wacky little project? No, no, I, th I think that's nice. And, and, and it does bring me to the point that um, uh, Alan had the idea that, hey, if you want your software to be good, put it in front of a user and see what they do. And a while back when my students were installing FreeBSD with now that we have ZFS as kind of a default, it's like the first option in the menu. Yep, correct. Uh, uh, they couldn't figure out what the hell it means to like have a single or a stripe or Manga. mirror. Yep. Or what the hell is this 4K thing, you know? So uh, I, I, it, it, it feels that it's very much oriented to um, uh, admins out of the box, which is fine, of course. But maybe there should be like a sub menu that says like advanced options or something like that. Mm. I'm, I'm not sure yet. Yeah. And there's a, an extremely American saying called inside baseball, which is like, Yes. Okay, um, here are some things that make sense to only the people who are closest to it. And yes, an administrator might know all that stuff, but that doesn't mean a new user will have any clue what 4K refers to. Especially and... about Linux users, because like they, a lot of them have no idea, like with the desktop Linux users, they don't know anything about RAID, they don't know anything about, and we also have that old... Uh, old but useful i should say the lenovo fix remember that oh yeah no that, that burned me absolutely every which way and i'm very glad that sprouted up yay thank you on uh, alan and company yeah so the, the, those are like tiny things that when my students were using it at the first time they were like oh what what what's what's this uh obviously the solution to that is like open the handbook everything is documented in there uh, but not every user is going to go like, okay, let me open the handbook on one side and uh, the installer on the other side, you know? Yeah. And it is pretty typical. You are set us. Uh oh, did it work? It worked. Oh, boy. So, <laughs> oh, did I get two of them? Oh, my gosh. Let me zoom in. Oh, by the way, the, the mirror swap and the encrypt swap seems very interesting for first time Linux users in the sense that. Um, they don't have this option in their systems. Yeah, like you can't choose. If if you're not encrypting, it's not encrypted. If you're encrypting, it's it is encrypted. So like the, there's no option to make it encrypted or not. Kind of. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that is. Oh, and and that, that does. Sorry, I, I keep. I please, keep... please, please. No, no. I'm just saying. Here's yeah. a picture. Uh, I, 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 uh, when I recovered the USB flash drive for my friend yesterday. Mm. Uh, he asked me, what file system do you recommend? And I told him ZFS. And he said, ZFS on a USB stick. I'm like, well, it's portable. You know, it works on Windows, Mac, Linux, FreeBSD. So I don't think you would have a portability problem. Uh, he said, okay, let's try it. But I need it to be encrypted this time. Oh, I'm interesting. As files. Interesting. Said, okay, sure, let's do that. So we did, uh, we, cre we created a Z pool on a USB stick. And then I tried the new native ZFS encryption. Yep. Uh, and it practically worked like a charm, especially with like key uh, key format equals prompt mm -hmm. or like key source equals prompt. I think it was key format equals prompt. And um, I wonder if that should also be an option in our installer instead of the 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 galley one. Oh, like, dude, yeah, of course. Like, uh, yeah. Um... Yeah, or, or maybe like we, we now that the new FreeBSD system is also doing, um, what's it called? Is also doing um, uh, one data set per user. Mm -hmm. We can also ask like encrypt home, you know. So, so like th this sounds like good questions to ask in in the uh, both in in Illumos land and FreeBSD land to have. Although I I don't know if ZFS encryption has landed in Illumos. I know it, it definitely did. That was one of the features they pulled in it, right okay. or wrong. And it had a few rough edges either yeah, after Illumos or before it or something and somewhere in there, but it, it's yeah. there. Uh, prompt to. Right, the, how about your home directory? Your home. Oh, and now don't get me wrong. Then things like user add or add user and i've always gotten those clipped for like 30 years uh might want to actually have some notion of zfs and encryption 
Is it my crazy? Is that crazy talk? I didn't get that part. So you create a new user, like you build a system. There it is. Like, oh, I forgot to add Entrenag. So I want to create Entrenag. And then, yes, it prompts for a password. Should it also be prompting for, say, encryption? That's a good point. That's a very good point. Um, uh, I, I I like the Mac OS way of doing it, which is yeah. the user password opens the the onboard security chip, which has the key of the encryption. So, like the user password is the 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 user's password rather is is the way to decrypt the the disk and on macOS yeah. it's it's done very it's done very neatly because like they have the the containers in in Apple FS yeah like the operating system Apple FS is not encrypted because it doesn't need to it, yeah it's, it's, it's immutable but the the other container where is your users that one is encrypted and it it gets decrypted with the user's password. Interesting. So I, how to integrate that with the ZFS, but that might be something to look into because it would give more of a native uh, way. Like when the user logs in properly, uh, their key gets loaded into ZFS somehow. I'm sure that 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 means right, some right, yeah. Also the same on Windows, by the way. Yeah. Uh, on Linux, not so much, because if you do Linux encryption at boot time, it's going to ask you, well, please prompt in your yeah. separate or put in the USB key or whatever, and then do you have a separate user thing? Yeah, but that might be a good idea to have it integrated. I, I see the value of this in projects like GhostBSD, uh, where it's like... Oh, right, like, yep, yeah. uh, like a live CD. You know. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, so, or, so oh, yeah, or a live CD, right? Like, you know the password, you don't care much about the uh, the encryption. It's like, okay, fine, it's encrypted, but as soon as, because I know the password, maybe I can root in and yeah. do the user login and it should automatically load the key. So th that, that might be a good idea to start like tinkering around to figure out the most unix way of doing it. I have no idea, by the way, at the top of my head, like how would like would ZFS need some kind of a PAM integration or like NSA switch integration? Yeah. It's not, it's not not clear in my head. No worries, but let's get the idea out there. What it yeah. need. PAM R. So, whenever I hear the notion of a password manager, and if it's any piece of software or external thing that scares the heck out of me because one mistake and everything's like gone. Um, I had the notion of a small ZFS partition on quite a few machines that is encrypted and perhaps only has administrative access and you hand out a password when needed and mm -hmm. administratively either update with snapshots or new kit or something, but suddenly at least it's a completely portable, air quotes, portable standard that is cross-platform. It is in OS as opposed to some third party. So I I also have some crazy thoughts related to this, but I love that notion of user integration. Yeah, that, that would be really interesting to see, yes. Um, Any another, thoughts? Go ahead. Another thing that, that uh, popped to my head because yeah. you said password manager is um, a pass. It's password-store.org. It's the password, is the we call it the standard Unix password manager. Uh, okay. Because it's very Unixy. It has a directory with files which contain your passwords that are PGP encrypted. So, like, it works portably on every operating system. That um, is more what it looks like. Correct. Some form of encrypted standard. I've been using well disk images on a certain OS, but yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's a shell <laughs> script, and it's POSIX shell script, not Bashism or anything like that. Uh. Etc. Etc. So, uh, why did I come get to here? I'm trying to remember that. Well, because I proposed right. just using pat, you know, ZFS as your password manager. Because uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know you don't have a password manager, so this might be a good idea for you. Oh, I do, but it's it's in base tools as opposed to some third party thing, right. yeah. <laughs> like over my dead body. Anyway, uh, oh, so you don't have that? GPG in base anymore, right? That is a very good question, and. 
fortunately we have multiple OSs represented today. Uh, passwordstore.org or what? That came up in some marketing site. Um, I'm sorry. Like it should be password store. Password store <laughs> um, uh, Yes, there's no hyphen. Got yeah, it. Dash, Beautiful. Sorry, yes. Why have I not heard of this? Now I'm angry. <laughs> okay. No, no. The uh, author is the same person who created WireGuard. So, like, dude. Okay. Well then, uh, yeah. Okay. Oop, that didn't work. Boom. Love it. Okay. Ah. Uh, boom. There's a correct link from the author of WireGuard. Great. That I will take a look at. I'm excited. Uh, Hans, any thought on this, to, just for what it's worth? Any crazy, crazy ideas as we're brainstorming? Not at the top of my um, head. No. Are you using native encryption on Lumos? Uh, no. Personally, I'm not using it. Okay. Well, I wanted to, but... Um... Yeah, no worries. I think there's there's very very good integration into um the surrounding distribution ecosystems, and um, what's most important part that's missing would be um, proper bootloader support. I know there are people aware of this and working on this, but not sure where this is at what state. Actually, Antony is. FreeBSD doing something native or using the same loader, you'd think that uh, it, there should be some low-hanging fruit here. <laughs> I don't know. Cool. So let's get it back to Beehive. Um, we talked about Wi-Fi box now uh, from BSD can and the Fediverse and all the things. Uh, with all the news from VMware and you name it, People really need live migration, even if they only emotionally think they need it. So I nudged a mailing list topic that uh, I think it was Mr. Grooms brought up a few, uh, maybe a year ago. I hope that John Baldwin and company as a maintainer can just get us somewhere and, and swing a hammer or to do whatever it takes to just get at least the file, the underlying format work done because it just has to happen. <laughs> I hope the enterprise working group can mumble about that. Antrenig, have you heard anything from the EWG recently? Uh, no, not 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 on my end. I'm I'm currently focused on uh, uh, <laughs> cleaning up the uh, what do you call that? The commercial support page of the website. Uh, oh, no kidding. Cool. Because uh, there are a lot of companies there that just don't exist anymore. Yeah. And probably um, ones that now exist and aren't there. So it's kind of exactly. lose-lose. Yeah, that's cool. True. And also some of them, they don't have FreeBSD on their website. But when I contacted them over email or LinkedIn, they're like, yeah, we can still do FreeBSD if, if cool. someone asks. You know? uh... so from the enterprise working group, I'm focusing more on that because I've been getting a lot of questions from like telecom, et cetera, uh, that, hey, if we use FreeBSD, is there commercial support? Because uh, that's one of the main reasons why they chose to go with Solaris and uh, Red Hat. So I'm trying to figure that out and maybe also figure out a similar page in the Illumos website, right? If there are any companies who do Illumos um, commercial support, maybe subscription model or anything like that, would be very interesting. Amen. Uh, because from the from the enterprise point of view, as far as I can tell, and I don't want to hurt anybody, but I would gladly hurt people. Uh, people apparently don't know how computers work, and they think the right way of using computers is I want to pay someone, submit a ticket, and get an answer within twenty four hours. Like that's that's enterprise apparently. Uh, yeah, uh, you're not wrong. And the throat to choke, butt to kick, blah blah blah. Yeah, and yeah. I, I bump into that. Yeah. Uh, and very, very common in like the sysadmin uh, subreddit. Like people yeah. are like, oh, I can't use Beehive because there's no commercial support uh, or stuff like that. So that, that's um, very... Yes. And coming uh, talking to some Hollywood folks, it's like, well, you know, even 
Proxmox subscriptions might not be enough sort of auditing and validation to make certain bean counters happy and auditors happy. So it's like, okay, well, what's that look like? Ooh, and from yesterday's open ZFS call, uh, B -b -b Greg, who had lots of SNMP examples and beautiful graphics, he's like, hey, we had a budget to prototype our own DIY storage system with just, in their case, Linux and ZFS to save them like, you know, <laughs> tens of thousands per year on either licensing or proprietary solutions or whatever. So we cannot deny companies that option by just whatever is missing. So Red Hat certainly did well with uh, supported Linux on supported environments for fancy regulated environments. And, oh, I just heard yesterday from a colleague that Red Hat apparently is doing a deal with Oxide. So, yeah, okay, maybe, cool. Um, well, yeah, more more like a like a partnership. And partnership. Like that. Yeah, that, that, that would be something very interesting. To, uh, I mean, I, I would gladly, like, spend money on, well, if you're doing business with Illuria, here are some hardwares that we recommend. No HP, yep. no Supermicro, go with this Dell, or this is specific right. Super something like that, where people can be, okay, so if we buy this and we get a subscription from Illuria or from Gameframe, yep. then yep, you know, yep, yep. We, we can get an answer within 24 hours. Um, I will be back in 30 seconds as I move something that's blocking my kid from doing a TV. Just one moment. Go ahead and talk amongst <laughs> yourselves. Does bring me to this, this if Q Max Lem. I remember seeing that in Illumos as well, but I don't remember how it. I think it was in DL, DL, DL admin, DL. What was it? <coughs> Oops. I'm back. DL, yeah, DL Adam. Let's props. Show props, I think. Show props. Show link prop. Show. And let me know when it's a good time for you to talk about this little breakthrough. Uh, which one? Oh, yeah, that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so, that. Uh, the longest short version is uh, if anyone was in the jail zone school of last week, um, we I, I, I used NetGraph Buddy to set up a bridge and uh, three uh, interfaces, one for the host and two for each jail. And when we did the test last week, the return number, the reach rise was very, very high. We're talking like thousands to tens of thousands. And we posted that video a couple of days yep. ago. Yep. Michael got back from the woods and yes. I got a message from Yannick on uh, LinkedIn. First of all, I was amazed that people do actually watch us. Um, second of all, if you're not subscribed, please do. And uh, third of all, Yannick's, uh, Yannick, Yannick Gravel, yes, thank you very much. Is that Yannick how you spell Yannick? Yannick with a Y? Oh, it's, it's pretty phonetic, yes. Okay, well, J-A-N-I-K, Yannick. Uh, CK. CK? Okay, yes. phonetic in English, yeah, not a thing. Go ahead. <laughs> a Yannick response was there's a free BSD review about this issue that Ooh, got link. abandoned. Stop yep, right there. Link, 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 link. That got abandoned for some reason. Uh come on, link. Then I, I I'm I, I'm okay with clicking on a link. Jesus. Okay, no, you're not. Uh here's it. Sorry, it's in the chat. So Perfect. this Thank is you. about so NGI phase increased default TXQ size to 4096. The default is 50. Five zero. Yes. Is that from like I386 single core or something like that? Probably from when NetGraph was created. I'm not sure. I mean, the, the, the net link if Q max len is for the whole operating system default. Now, yeah. when you create an interface, let's say you're creating an ePair, you can modify that in the ePair. You can say, hey, for this interface, the if Q max len should be that, right? Also in the bridge or anything like that. I'm not sure about the yeah in the bridge as well, right? So or any kind yeah. of interface. Uh, in NetGraph, it's not being modified when the interface is being created. So I actually had to put it. I had to change the default first 
to nine, uh, 4096, rebooted the machine, and now I have zero retries because the buffer is not full. It's just doing things properly. And I'm getting the 10 gigabit as promised without any issues. Um, I also did a stress test of all the other applications. So I retested NetGraph, I retested VLANs, I retested aggregation, aggregation? Yeah, Aggre aggregation, you said it perfectly. Yes, I retested um, the regular Ethernet interface, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it, everything worked. I mean, it, it didn't have a, a side effect on other interfaces, as far as I can tell. Uh, okay. Maybe the other ones are already allocating more than 50 when they are being created, but not on NetGraph. So this was a good find. Thank you very oh. much, Young. Well, hold on. Is a 10 gig interface involved, or is this purely kernel space and maybe it could this even be faster? purely kernel space. So why is it 10 gig ish? Uh, because it 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 the, the virtual interface says to the operating system that it is a ten gig interface. Now I assume. How do we it, tinker with that and see if it'll exactly. go faster? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, there should be a way to tinker with that and make it like much. I mean, in in Illumos, for example. Yeah. And Hans, correct me if I'm wrong. If you create a a v, an ether stub and connect a VNIC to it. It advertises itself as a gigabit, but somehow you can get like 24 gigabits because it's in memory and the memory can handle it. Yeah, I mean, the speed on a, on a VNIC is, well, it's a good question, really, if, if you attach it to a real hardware, whether it inherits the um, yeah. getting from the real hardware, but I would figure it's all virtual anyway, so why bother? I think I can check it from here, by the way, Michael. So I'll I would hope it. it's not an artificial limit. That's my one thought. It's like, yeah. <laughs> and of course, uh, it was impressive to see 10 gig on a, like a ThinkPad P420 with Beehive, like, ooh, well, you know, fancy schmancy. But um, that would be unfortunate if it artificially limits it because reasons. I wonder if I can get the properties of a vnic i don't know how to do that i think it's show vnic dash p i might be wrong i am wrong dash p capital not so much so for example a vnic a visual NIC in illumos has a speed of zero like the speed says it's zero it doesn't say like a gigabit it's like oh it's zero it's it's probably as much as it can you know move in between i guess i'm not sure uh, well, i'll also it's check arbitrary because it it will do what it does huh. and if i look at the vnic in a zone i can see that it's a speed 1000 but i think they're not created on an ether stop on this machine ah uh, okay yeah M mines are on an ether stop yes hmm. now, i have an ether stop here does this all and if i look it up in a global zone yeah, it's over a one gig interface, and uh, all of them are set at speed one thousand. I don't think the kernel does any throttling or anything there. That that would make no sense. That would I make should. no sense. Oh, the dash T switch zero. I have no idea. Um. I need to learn more about this. But yeah, basically on Illumos, if I'm connecting it to a completely memory-based, so either stub, which we call it a bridge for BSD, I can see that it says the speed is zero. If it's a it's if it's connected to the physical, uh if it's if the VNIC is created from a physical interface, it will show the speed of the physical interface. Got uh, it. Interesting. And in my server with the other stub, I think I was able to get like 40 gigs. Exactly. <laughs> on on nice. curve, I'm, at, at nice. that point, my bottleneck is like disk, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <Hell. laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. Well, let's explore that because if we can go yet higher. Uh, oh, actually, so what hardware was this on? Based this was on the Lenovo T four hundred eighty S. ThinkPad T four hundred eighty s. It has a it 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 has a pretty uh, yeah four eighty. Oh, 480. oh four eighty yes oh yes yes of course yes. okay. Yes. 
Oh, uh, well, let's try it on some more server like hardware. Yeah. And I was a, and this has a pretty okay CPU, I think like eight gen Intel something, something. Yeah. Uh, the memory is big. I think it's like 32 gigs of RAM on the mm -hmm. laptop. So uh, no, no, no problems there. And um, it's pretty idle either, other than running uh, some Java applications for Unify. But yeah, it, 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 I, 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 personally, I'm pretty happy with this uh, setup. It's very simple. It's EPR bridge like thanks to NetGraph Buddy. And uh, no more re the reader problems are, are like that, that they don't exist here anymore. Um, now I need to do a comparison with like uh, EPR Bridge versus uh, NetGraph. That would be the next uh, comparison. Not yes, just the speed, sir. but like yes. for example, for a long time EPR Bridge had an ARP problem where it would just hang. You know, like a lot of issues were were like that. So I need to go and dig into um, the bugs and figure those out. So yeah. Very happy though, very happy. Like next release of Jailer, definitely gonna add a Jailer in the graph. Yeah. Um, can one simply benchmark NetGraph alone on a host and just set up the interface and run tests like this without a Jailer, without a VM, without anything yes. fancy? It, yes, but syntax it, it, off the top of your head. From it Daniel would Obama it would be kind of weird because like if you have two interfaces. And they each of them have their own IP, and if you try to do some kind of a test between those IPs, yep. well, the computer is going to be like, "Oh, I am those IPs. I'm going to use LO zero." Ah, yeah, okay. So th that's why I kind of had to do to use the jail. Uh, mm. My next uh, step is, force to, it, basically. Though, yeah. is to integrate. Um, so, like for a long time, I used EPR Bridge also with the physical interface, right? Where the physical interface is also in the bridge. So which means that your jails are exposed to your physical network. So my question is now going to be, if I do that with NetGraph, what kind of a difference would I see? Cool. Yeah. And also keep in mind that uh, NetGraph's bridge has a very neat feature yeah. where you can tell it that when an interface, so sorry, when a frame is leaving a physical interface, uh, change the MAC address to the physical interface instead of the jails MAC address, right? Oh. So from inside, you would see uh, the MAC addresses of the host and the jail. Yeah. Jails. Yeah. But from the outside, you would only see the MAC address of the host, even though there are multiple IP addresses going to it, you know, the host and the jails. Now, this is very interesting because if you have like some kind of a, a quote unquote military grade network, uh, like ESX size default network setup or Azure networking, you know, the cloud networking where it doesn't allow any kind of, uh, 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 what do you call that? Mac, Mac, Mac spoofing and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, unless you have a uh, pro, promiscuous, promiscuous mode. Yeah. 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 Then this would bypass that, right? You, you would be, it would be like, oh, it's a different IP, but same Mac address. So this, is most probably valid and I'm just going to allow it to move forward. Yeah. Quick question. Would that solve the beehive on Wi-Fi problem? The beehive on, I don't understand. So the that. problem from day one is you're like, oh, I'll just create a, a bridge with my two tap interfaces and like WLAN zero. And on WLAN zero, apparently it ambiguously uh, doesn't tell the outside world like is that mac address from the laptop from vm number one or vm number two uh, let's see generally oh, have to run nat to achieve that it's the opposite this of that okay yeah this is like everything that is coming is coming from the laptop so you could okay yeah so it'd make it worse but okay yeah. fine cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah in beehive case you want to do a beehive with a regular bridge where the wlan and the tap interfaces are part of the bridge and then it should all work fine I mean, uh, no, 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 no. It's ambiguous what? to the outside world. So you don't get incoming traffic. It's that like, is very weird. That's a classic. But I have a new workaround that took me only a decade to think of, which is you just take any Android and possibly Apple phone, you connect to Wi Fi, you jam it in the side and use the UE0 as your, your Ethernet interface for the bridge, and everything works. <laughs> I've been using little <laughs> dongles like GLNet and TP link, exactly. which is our pain in the butt with a Wi-Fi, you get touch screen, you get everything just to set it up in like seconds. 
that is very weird because when I'm on my free BSD laptop, I don't do that. I'd love to see your config. And, and of course, this is a problem from 10 years ago. So maybe something's changed and I com am completely oblivious to it. But hey, I'd love to see your IF config on your laptop if it's not Ethernet, if it's on Wi Fi. Key point. Yeah, yeah, sure. Wi yeah, Wi Fi. Yes. Dude, drop in your IF config for the bridge. I'm curious. Okay. Okay. Moving on while you look that up. Uh, Daniel is not here. Daniel is a lovely European country for a wedding. Uh oh, too much information. But um, he made some prog with, progress with Vert IO console, trying to get, say, I believe ZFS sends through <laughs> a whole one megabyte. For... <laughs> yeah. So he's uh, tinkering with that and will report back when he hits uh, Tierra Firma. Well, actually, he's in very firm Tierra yeah. right now. So, uh, we can be brief on this one. I spent last weekend on FreeBSD's BSNMP, the built-in SNMP ecosystem in FreeBSD, which has a few things that are FreeBSD specific you might not find in, say, uh, Net SNMP, which everybody uses. And it was very, very interesting talking to Hans earlier before we started recording about the fact that uh, Illumos might, in fact, have either build dependencies on, let me try to find that, uh, build dependencies on net SNMP, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, maybe I didn't write it down. Actually. You did not write it, but you had a tab open. Oh, I did have a tab open. Correct. So I was first looking at every example in in Illumos of like, okay, there's a high box, all the topics. So I just started searching for there you go. SNMP, and I found a bunch of things. So, is this it? No, that's different. Um, nonetheless, uh, let me give you a tantalizing picture here. I mentioned a second ago that uh, Greg in Toronto is doing nifty things, and so he posted this lovely image of all the stuff in ZFS that he's tracking. And he shared some scripts that would keep, I'll leave to the user there. So his paste bin is there. But some love SNMP, some hate it. But I would love to know what in a Beehive context one might want to know as simple as listing running VMs or based on the conversation yesterday about ZFS, how do we track from a modern monitoring perspective potential collisions between host memory and guest memory and the ZFS arc? The absolute classic, burn the candle in three places and pray. So uh, do you two have any thoughts on that? Or shall I just keep collecting information and dropping them, dropping them into my, oh, 15 come like 17 come now 19 page document on this topic? Yeah. So uh, for me personally, one of the interesting things would be the out, uh, like somehow to aggregate and keep the following command of our beehive. Yes. Uh, trying to remember which one it was. Uh, beehive CTL dash dash uh, get uh, get was something info. Uh, either yeah, get stats or info or something. Let's see. Get stats. Yes get stats with dash dash VM equals, let's say this VM. Yeah, I would love to see that. The like the output of dash dash get stat equals VM. So per VM, the get stats, I mean, it has some very interesting information like number of ticks, I BCP, idle, yeah. wired memory, resident memory. In my case, it should be pretty, you know, close to each other. And uh, uh, it, it's basically a lot of the beehive information that you would need. Um, and the reason why I would need this is, let's say, if one of the guests had an issue, I can go into SNMP and have a look and say, oh, so like I had a spike in here or something like that, you know, so that that, that would be something interesting to know. Uh, another one was there was there's another command too. Um, I think it was. Right, there's also get all, 
but that mm -hmm. prints too much information, uh, like the registers and such. Um, I mean, cloud providers might need it, maybe, you know. Uh, but for me personally, uh, there's also like things like uh, a pause exit is set on vCPU zero. That's like good things to know. Uh, active CPUs, that's also good to know which ones are the ones that I pass to the machine, um, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, that, that would be a good, good, good one. Also, uh, there's like CPU topology, which is like sockets, two cores, 50 threads, two max CPUs, 256, you know, the, the stuff like that might also be interesting. So uh, overall it's, there, there's like good amount of info in the Beehive CTL command that someone yeah. could use to. Uh, sent to us an MP uh, for monitoring purposes. But so they've been keeping that up with new features like the topology, because my fear was that um, it might just be out of date and it hasn't changed since, say, 12 years ago. And I'm happy to be wrong. Uh, I personally don't know. Okay. Uh, I I mean we could always look into the uh, Git logs. Um, cap name get cap. Oh, you know, good lord! I gave a talk on this. I put a link in there. I'm, I'll try to find the slides. But yeah. yeah. Um, but but overall, my idea is like the 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 from the Beehive's perspective, it would be nice to see two t levels of integration. One from base where there is like, okay, if there's a VM, I'm going to run these commands on it and expose these OIDs. And the second level is, okay, let's say VM Beehive is the most common automation tool. Uh, the output of VM Beehive parsed into, parsed and put into SNMP, right? So something like uh, how many VMs do I have? How many of them are running? How much full memory I have? How many of them am I using? Sorry, how many of them are allocated and how many of them am I using, right? Because if it's not wired memory, then you would also want to know how much is it actually being used. Um, and maybe in case of VMB Hive, also uh, each VM's interfaces, disks, stuff like that would be very interesting to know. You know, I mean, it does print the output. Like if you do VM info, VM name, yeah, it's going to print you all of the important output. Yeah, uh, yeah. In, oh, in a well uh, yeah. Uh, no, does it have LibXO? Uh, no, it doesn't. As far as I can tell, the only automation tool at all uh, in the most famous ones, so Bastille, VM, Beehive, anything yeah. that a lot of the community is using, Jailer is the only one that can give you JSON output when it should. Mm. Like the create command will not return to you a JSON output because you should look for the exit code. Okay. But the list and the info do have proper JSON outputs. And it's kind of a first class citizen because we have to use it in our product. So I, I can't like just leave that behind. And the latest uh, jailer got a major JSON update. Uh, but previously I would just put list of IPs in a string. Now it's like a properly formatted JSON list, you know, and stuff like that. So. Um, to my knowledge, no, none of the major ones have anything like that. Was Jailer public before the calls? Uh, yes. Okay, just checking. Uh, wrote in early 2018, I guess. Uh, but we open sourced it in, I'm sure, the uh, October 20th, 2022. Cool. So is there a port? for ports and packages in your future? Uh, yeah, but not yet. The CLI is very unstable. I like the dash M used to mean net mask. Now it's going to mean memory limit. Ah, for got it. CTO. Yep. So as soon yep. as I'm done finishing those, then I'll put it into ports. Cool. And packages. Yes. Um, cool. Uh, do, 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 do. Well, I guess we're onto something, and I suppose here's a perfect example of what, like, what's missing if we go from a decade ago to today. Um, am I? Is that right? No. So, by default, BSNMP has things exciting like NetGraph and PF and Past. <laughs> and it's like, okay, cool, but what's past? Uh, 
think it's there. Oh, here we go. Sorry. Uh, so like, okay, where's ZFS? Where Beehive? Where are the things that came along in the last decade? <laughs> so I was impressed to see that it's like some notion of that. And broadly, I'd love to know what the overhead is of say this versus net SNMP. And yes, there's a call for testing for SNMP v3 code. And I, I don't know where that stands. Uh, someone tried to use it. And so I'm waiting on a confirmation of a bug or not from the guy maintaining the UCD, UC Davis port of their plugin goodies, which has extensibility. Uh, uh, Michael, my main question would be, does BSNMP support V3? It has a call for testing bit for that. So let's go take a look at that. Uh, V3. Oh, it's sitting in a tab somewhere. So there is a call for testing for code from Jeliana some Jeliana some time ago. I see. So that requires yet more investigation, but I'm waiting to hear back if we, that entire the value is very low, you know. Uh like okay, it's it's part of base, but it doesn't have V3, has a lot less value than it's not part of base, but it does have V3. Oh, in my recent search history. So um Someone did some pretty good homework here on like, okay, hey, I'm trying it. Um, there's the call for testing. There is um, the config mentioning it, and then mm -hmm. Latera maybe having it, and then they're like pounding their head against it. So yes, maybe I, I this I'm not yet to that level of of depth in it, but I will make note of that. Having just found it here, V3. So I don't have that in the doc. So up down here do 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 do, do. uh you've got a quotation is this like Are dtrace you? kind of rotting away <laughs> uh ba, 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 ba. so then that said uh question e3 support note this wait my keyboard is the worst on the planet note this thread okay not call it a thread call it a whatever but there it is um Okay, so that's something to investigate, but not on this call. Thank you. But it sounds like you see some value in that. And I I thought that something like G MQTT would be taking over the world for communicating this type of information, but no, switch vendors are not going to just flip overnight to something new. So we have SNMP, love it or hate it. And there is a book on the topic from Michael W. Lucas, and you're encouraged to check that out. Um Let's go take a look at that. And quite funny, um, Lucas. Okay, so I included the manual pages. I included his recent book, 2020. It's pretty fresh. He does touch on it in absolute BSD. He had an article, perhaps in the very first BSD magazine, a very, very long time ago about exactly that. Um, I include the Japanese blog post that was helpful for smart data down below. And uh, yeah, it's a thing, but it is just like neglected and that's frustrating. And so let's, I'm, I'm just trying to map out what's missing, what's there. And uh, Hans, have you used SNMP also, over the years? I was going to say that, like what's, what's the SNMP status on uh, Illumos? Senta had some support, eh? Yeah. We talked, yeah, just before you jumped on, and so sorry to go over this again, Hans, but can you brief us on, for example, what Nixenta did back in the day? Uh, what Nixenta did? Um, for SNMP. I don't, for SNMP. I know that yeah, one of my co-workers worked on uh, net SNMP support, but I have no idea what he had done. Okay, no uh, worries. Um, what what what's the state of Nexenta in twenty twenty four? If I may, I'm, I'm... well, Nexenta no longer exists in that form. They have been bought by DDN. Ah, the 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 Borg. And okay. DDN also bought Tigile, and all of that merged together. And last time I talked to them was in twenty twenty one, almost okay. two years ago. 
I did briefly work for Tintree, which is what became of um, Make Center and TGL and all that. Okay. Um, and then and Tintree is a part of um, of DDN, or at least it was when when I talked to them last time. And Bonwick showed Sudo Sudoku Raid Z at a storage developer summit, which was quite interesting. It was promptly bought by DDN, I believe. It was a completely all flash, multi dimensional Raid Z for some reason. No, ah, good times. Good times. Not like too much, but um, can someone explain to me, like on five or well, five fifteen, uh, what D Raid is? Oh yeah, so that is a virtual spare for high number of disk systems. And so when a, a spare kicks in, it is instantly available and then it gets re-silvered somewhat offline as opposed to catching up. So you always preserve some level of redundancy is my understanding. And it's just starting to show up in say true NAS and such. But uh, if, unless you have a massive system with like massive VDEVs, it's generally not something your average user needs, but it's my, quite my, my promising. It's going to have uh, 45 disks each. Would, would, would it make sense to use it there? It might, but although if you do say maximum 10 disks per VDEV, we're talking for VDEV, so maybe at least you, you are definitely on the sort of cusp of it. Okay. Um, that's one of those topics where either for the user summit or something we may just want to say okay here maybe here are a whole bunch of virtual disks and let's just see if we can work out what's you know tangibly more valuable okay. but it's absolutely designed for you know petabytes okay because because the new system is going to be like a uh, for you with two boards and 45 disks each so like 90 disks total and i keep wondering if they have was it called multi path multi path yeah where the uh, the PCI card gets switched between uh, one of the two systems, so like I could have ninety disks total. Ooh, um, disks multipath. Total. Um, it solves a problem I've never had, and it creates like fifteen other problems. So okay. use it with caution. <laughs> and maybe that's specific to FreeBSD, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. anyway. Sounds good. And, well, uh, for the Euro competition, no football today. Maybe oh, no football. Oh, geez. Sorry. Um, any other topics for the official call? I don't know if we'll do any hacking later, but I know people seem to enjoy that. And the cat thought far more than breaking news, but whatever. That's that's the market. <sighs> Please subscribe. Like, won't subscribe. Anything else, Hans? Antrenig? No. Awesome. Well, let's call it. I'm gonna, I'll do 1811 UTC, and I wish you a fantastic rest of the week and happy fourth to those who celebrate. Congratulations. Thank you.